Well, good evening and welcome to our service tonight. Hope you've had a good week. I certainly have. And uh, be sure you invite somebody to go to church with us tonight. You can tag them uh, by sharing the post, or I believe you can even tag them there in the comments. And uh, sure, it's been a pretty day. Don't know where our warm weather went, but uh, apparently old man winter still had a, a little bit left in him. But looking forward to some... Uh, some brighter days ahead, a little bit of sunshine. Well, tonight we're going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 6 and also in James chapter 1. So if you want to find your place in both of those uh, passages of Scripture, Matthew chapter 6 and James chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and share this post to uh, my page. Um, and uh, take just a moment and do the same uh, so that others can watch along with us. So I'm going to be asking this question tonight, and this is something that um, that is a little bit of a difficult question to answer, but it's worth asking in a time like this when we are facing such difficulty as a nation. And the question is this, does God lead us into temptation? Does he lead us into temptation? And uh, so I hope to answer that here in just a moment. If you've got some prayer requests, be sure and drop those in the comments. And I love to be able to go back through that and pray over those needs and add folks to our prayer list. Now, uh, if ever before, we need to be a people of prayer. Let's not forget that, okay? And uh, when people ask us to pray for them, they are expecting that we will pour ourselves into prayer over those needs. And I've had a lot of texts that have come in this week, and, uh, and as have some of you, and some of you have seen prayer requests that have come across your, your Facebook feed, and people will say, pray over this need. And when you see that, realize that people, they need someone who is willing to go to work in prayer on their behalf. And so let's be those kind of Christians and let's pray for one another tonight. And uh, see folks checking in here. Hello, Miss Robin and and uh, Brother Ken. I see Jacob uh, and Shay are watching, Brother Irvin, and uh, many others have, uh, have uh, joined with us tonight. And uh, so I appreciate you being a part of uh, the service this evening. I want to remind you real quick before we get into the message about online giving. And uh, I just want to challenge you. Normally on Wednesday night, we'd pass up an offering plate and uh, take an offering for either our building fund or our missionaries. But I want you to be thinking about our missionaries tonight. And uh, if you've got online giving already set up, why don't you just take a moment and just give something. Doesn't matter what the amount is. Uh, towards our missions fund. I'm going to do that right now while I've got everybody here on um, online. I went ahead and saved uh, text to give into my contacts, and I just set it up as a contact for online giving. And uh, so tonight I want to give to our missionaries, and I want to give an offering of uh, $50. So I'm texting on my phone here, uh, 50 missions. You can see that here on my phone, and I'm going to hit send, and uh, got a response back, said thank you for the gift, and that goes into our missions account. And so if you'd like to do the same thing, maybe it's just $5, $10, maybe a little bit more, and uh, as we get close to the end of the month, another $7,500 will go out to our missionaries, and so let's just take a little time, pass up the virtual, the virtual offering plate, and see if we can raise a little bit of money here for our missionaries that are serving around the world. Well, let's pray together, and we'll ask God's blessing on our lesson, and we'll jump right into things tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for our church. Thank you for the many blessings, Lord, that we have received this week. And Lord, I pray that you'd continue to be with our nation and uh, Lord, help our president and those that are leading us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as Christians, Lord, not to lose faith in the storm. Lord, we don't know that we have faith until our faith is tested. Well, it's being tested now. And so Lord, help us to stay true to your word. Help us to keep our eyes on you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and start in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew tonight. I miss Sonia. 
I see you writing on there, Miss April, Miss Carol. Been praying for you guys uh, with the funeral this week of Miss Ruth, and I uh, hope all the family is doing well. And we continue to pray for uh, Brother Don as he's gone uh, through all of that with losing his wife and such. But I want us to look here in Matthew chapter 6. And this is where the disciples have asked the Lord the question, uh, Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us to pray. And he gives them this model prayer. Now, we refer to this as the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord would never have to pray a prayer like this. It was just something that he gave to us as a model on how we can pray and get our needs met. So listen to some of these verses. We'll not read all of it, but let me just uh, give you a few thoughts here. In verse number eight, he says, Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now we talked about that in uh, one of our recent messages about how uh, we're to be depending upon God daily for our needs. We don't have to pray a month in advance. We don't have to pray for everything 12 months in advance. God wants us to trust him day by day for our provisions. And for most people around the world, this is a reality. Most people have to pray, Lord, give us this day something to eat. And until recently, we've never experienced anything like that in our lifetime, many of us as Americans. Well, uh, our, our outlook on prayer has changed a little bit in recent days, hasn't it? But he goes on to say this, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then here's our text for the night. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So here's the question that I want to ask you this evening. Does God lead his children into temptation? Now, that's not a real easy uh, question to answer. All right. Uh, if we are to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, does that mean that God at some point is going to lead us into temptation under some kind of a circumstance? Well, if so, what kind of temptation are we talking about? And why would God deliberately lead his children into something that he warns us to stay away from? We know that temptation is always seen as a bad thing in the Bible. So why are we having to pray for God not to lead us into it? Okay. Now, if I was just to go around and ask everybody this question individually on, on what you thought about this, I think we'd probably get some different answers from different people. All right. If I was to ask some of you, uh, do you think that God would ever lead his children into temptation? Some of you would say without a hesitation, no, no way. Because that's what God is trying to keep us away from, right? Well, it would be really hard to disagree with that because there's so many Bible verses that we could point to that would verify that answer. Well, if I was to ask the next guy, do you think that God leads us into temptation? Uh, somebody would say, well, I don't know, preacher, maybe, but I'm not sure. Sometimes I think that he does, and sometimes I think that he doesn't. So for some of you, the answer is no, and for others, it's maybe, right? But then there are others that, you know, thinking from this, really from a spiritual standpoint, some of you would say, no, wait a minute, preacher. Yes, of course God does. Because times of testing and trials doesn't all of that make us stronger? So there you have it. There's your answer tonight. The answer is no, maybe, and yes. <laughs> all right, so we haven't gotten anywhere, have we? It's a really good question. Does God lead his children into temptation? Well, let me show you a few possibilities on what this could mean. And what I want to show you tonight 
I think is really, really going to help you. And I hope that it'll put you in the right perspective on what we're dealing with, with this coronavirus and all the other craziness that people are having to deal with on a daily basis, from homeschooling to losing a job, to having people in the hospital that you're worried about, to sickness. I mean, whatever it is, what we're talking about tonight, this truth is going to really help you because it's helped me. Okay. On one level, we could all agree that to pray this prayer, when we look at it from one angle, it seems like we are just saying, Lord, keep us from trouble. Lord, please don't let anything bad happen to us. And I would agree with that. I think that that is a great explanation of what that verse means. As a matter of fact, nearly every Bible commentator that I've read on the subject usually say that that's what it means. We're asking God for his protection. And I believe that we should pray that. I, I, I don't think we should ever really even get in our car and turn the key on and put the car in drive, that we don't stop and say, Lord, protect me. Lord, lead me where I should go today and guide me in everything that I do. I, I believe that we should pray that prayer of protection. But it still doesn't ask the central question. Does God lead his children into temptation? Because the verse says we're to pray, lead us not into temptation. Now, if you're going to answer this question, it all depends on how we define the word temptation. Okay. Now, we know that everything that's written in the New Testament was written in Greek because that was the dominant language of the time. And so these words have meanings. But the word temptation in the Bible is used two primary ways, okay? It can mean on one hand something good, and on the other hand, it can mean something bad. Uh, for instance, it can be talking about a trial or a testing. That's one meaning of the word. And in those cases, uh, God is talking about difficult circumstances that happen in life, and God uses those to improve the quality of our faith so that we'll trust in Him, okay? That's the positive meaning. That's the good meaning of the word. But then there is a negative meaning that refers to temptation in the sense of it being a seduction or a solicitation to do evil. So this one word has got very two different meanings. One can mean trials, and the other can mean a solicitation to do evil. Now think about this for just a minute. I want you to go over to the book of James. I, I, want, you to, I want you to grasp this real quick before I give you my main thought tonight. James chapter 1 and verse number 2, James uses this word in two totally different ways in the same chapter. Look what it says, James chapter 1 in verse number 2. He tells us, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So answer me this question, which temptation is he talking about right there? Is he talking about a solicitation to sin, or is he talking about testing and trial? Well, I think the verse answers for itself, doesn't it? He is talking about those times that we are facing difficulty. God says, you know what? We can still have joy because we know in those trying times that it's working, uh, that the trying of our faith is working patience. God is doing something behind the scenes and so we can still have our joy intact, okay? Now drop down to verse number 13, and let me show you the opposite. Verse 13 says this, Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So here's the same exact word. You see tempt or tempted, it's being used as a verb here, but it's the same word as verse number two. The same word is used in a positive sense, is used in verse two, is used in a negative sense in verse 13, okay? 
Now, here's what I want you to understand. God will never, ever, never, never, ever, never lead you to a place where you are forced to do evil or commit sin. Okay? It's important that you understand this. God does not solicit people to evil. God cannot. The Bible says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He takes no pleasure in sin whatsoever. Uh, you know why? Because God understands how deadly sin is. Sin cost his son his life. You think God is ever going to want to tempt a person with the very thing that cost his son his life and to be put on a cross and crucified? I remember uh, hearing a story years ago about a, and you've probably heard stories like this, uh, this particular guy, he had uh, raised this large Burmese python in his home and had had it since it was just, you know, the small baby. And so now the thing is enormous. But now he has gotten married and he has a baby of his own. And he wakes up one night and he realizes that that python has somehow escaped from its cage and has found its way into his baby's crib. And by the time he gets to that crib, that python has wrapped itself around that child and has squeezed all the life out of it. I can't even imagine the horror of experiencing something like that as a parent. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think for one minute that that man who had that pet kill his own baby, you think that guy's ever going to want a snake like that ever again in his house? No way. You see, sin cost the father the life of his son. So there's no way that anyone can ever say that God tempts us to do evil. Okay. Now, you may find yourself in a tough spot in life, and you may find that you're under a lot of pressure to do evil. And in your mind, you may think that you're forced. I don't have any choice. I had to commit wrong because my circumstances forced me to. Oh, there's judges all over the country that hear excuses like that. I, I had to murder them. What choice did they give me? What choice did I have? I had to steal. What choice did I have? Well, if you were in my circumstances, you would have cussed too. I mean, we can all use excuses like that. But the fact of the matter is, it was our choice, not God's. So let me say it another way. God never sets us up for failure. Never. If he did, it would contradict both his righteous nature and his love and his word. So, we still haven't answered our question, have we? If the question is, does God lead his children into temptation in the sense of directly or personally seducing them to do wrong, then the, then the answer is absolutely no. So why then does Matthew 6 tell us that we should pray for God not to lead us into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Well, let me get down to the meat of the message, okay? Let me ask two real important questions. If we already know that God does not solicit us to evil when we pray, lead us not into temptation, Aren't we just asking God to do something that he already said he would never do? Well, in that case, the prayer would seem like nonsense. Why would I pray and ask God to do something that he already said he would never do? Okay. If we know that trials and testings are good for us, and we know that they're necessary for our spiritual growth, and that James said we should rejoice when we experience them, because they build up our faith. All right? If that's true, 
then why would we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, if we're asking God to exempt us from what we know is necessary to build us up spiritually? How can we ask God to lead us away from something that he knows is in our best interest? Isn't this really confusing? So what's the answer? What's the answer? Well, the key to this is remembering the double meaning of the word temptation. Remember, on one hand, it means trials and testing. But on the other hand, it can be referring to a solicitation to do evil. So the key thing that I want you to remember, and write it down if you're taking notes, this is what you need to understand about the Lord's Prayer. What God gives us for a trial or a test is almost always used by the devil as a temptation. Now you better put that down big and bold and remember it because we're all going to go through times of trials and testing. But when we go through a trial, what God is using for good, you can mark it down. The devil will take the opportunity to use it for evil. The same trial can work for our good or it can work for evil. So God's going to try to accomplish something in my life. And he may be using COVID-19 right now to do it. Uh, he may be using job loss. He may be using sickness. He may be using all kinds of circumstances. But the same, what God is trying to accomplish in our life for our good, at the same time, the devil's trying to accomplish something completely opposite. Can I give you a few Bible examples of this tonight? When Jesus was in the wilderness, and he is going to be tempted by the devil, think about what we know from this, okay? We know that the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness on three different occasions, didn't he? And he tempted him. He tempted him to turn away from his purpose. He tempted him to disobey his heavenly father. He tempted him to go against uh, his word. Matthew 4 and verse number 1 says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. So let me ask you this. Who was doing the leading? The Holy Spirit was. The verse tells us. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. But who did the tempting in the wilderness? The devil did. Now there is no contradiction here at all. Did God know what was going to happen when he sent his son into the desert? Sure he did. If he didn't know, he wouldn't be God. Of course he knew. He intended from the beginning to demonstrate that his son would not yield to Satan's trick. The, the same thing is played out in the life of Job. God knew Job would not give in. God knew Job would stand the test. But it was the devil that did the tempting. So, was God tempting his own son? No, he wasn't. But was God putting his son in a place where he could be tempted? Well, I think we all have to agree that the answer to that is yes. So, write this down. When God sends a trial, Satan turns it into a temptation. Let me say that again. When God sends us a trial, you can guarantee that Satan will turn it into a temptation. Now, that's, that, that, that's an amazing thought to me. I do not believe that God ever directly solicits anybody to do evil because the Bible tells us flat out that he doesn't. And I'm a Bible believer. But it is true that from time to time, God's people are led into a place where the devil will come crawling up to them 
and they will face severe temptation from the devil. I believe it's possible. Now, Satan's doing the tempting, but God sometimes leads us into those places. Now, can I just say that in every area of life, we see this demonstrated, all right? So think about this. Let's suppose that a child of God contracts a deadly disease. Could that sickness be a testing from God, yes or no? Well, of course it can. Many good things are accomplished through sickness in the life of a Christian. I can speak from my own personal testimony. Uh, sometimes, uh, the, in my memory, the greatest things that have ever happened to me spiritually did not happen at church. They did not happen at the altar. They happened to me in a hospital bed. When the Word of God would would comfort my heart and, and His presence seemed so real and so close in my life, now, let me ask you this. Does the devil work through sickness too? Absolutely, he does. And through that very same sickness, God will, or the devil will take that same Christian and will tempt you to despair and to be angry and to get bitter and to if he has his way, get you to turn away from God. And so I believe what God intends for your spiritual good can be an avenue that Satan uses to pull you down. How about this one? Let's just suppose you lose your job. For some of you, this is a reality. There are some of you that are listening tonight that have been laid off. You've not been able to go to work. You've got a, you work for a place where uh, it's been temporarily shut down, not able to go in and, and get anything done, self-employed, struggling. Now, let me ask you, can that be from God? Well, sometimes it is. Sometimes a person loses their job and God ends up having a, a better purpose in mind. And some days we look back and we realize, wow, what I thought was terrible, God had something planned in my life that I never dreamed could be this good. So in that case, I think we would all agree. Oh, yes, Romans 8, 28, God worked all things together for good. But let me ask you this. During that same trial, that trial that was sent to you by God, can the devil use that? Sure. And, and, and let's be honest, folks. He's already been working on us. It's easy to get angry. It's easy to despair and to get discouraged. I've talked to preachers this week that are discouraged. I mean, they're just they're just flat out discouraged by everything that's going on in our world. I'm telling you, it can work both ways. How about this? Let's look at it from a different perspective, okay? Uh, let's suppose you get a promotion. You get a big raise in salary. And now you're better off financially than you've ever been before in your life. Can that promotion be a trial from God? <laughs> yes, it can. Prosperity is often a trial or a test just to see how well we can handle God's blessings. And in some cases, prosperity, it should make us more generous. It should make us uh, uh, willing to help uh, uh, the needy. Uh, we should be willing to tithe. We should be willing to give to missions. Yes, a blessing or a promotion, sure, it can be a test from God. But at the same time, can it be negative? Sure. The devil can come along and he can tempt us to get greedy and selfish and independent of God and stop praying and get full of pride. So those are just a couple examples tonight of how God intends uh, what he uses as a means of building us up. The devil can use it as a way of pulling us down. So 
l- let me let me draw a couple conclusions for you about this, okay? Conclusion number one is this. Testings and trials are a normal part of the Christian life. Would you agree with that? I mean, they're, they're, they're just part of God's curriculum for us. The Bible tells us all that will live godly will suffer persecution. I've said it many times. There's no such thing as a normal life. There's just life. We take it as it comes. But those trials, they build our faith. Uh, Those trials help us to build a testimony. Other people watch us. Our children watch us. Someday they grow up and they say, I want to have faith like dad because I remember in the storm, he never lost faith. I found him on his knees. I knew that he loved God. I knew that he read his Bible. All of those things are great. And folks, there is nothing that we can do to escape the trials of life. They're going to come. If you're not in one right now, hang on. You'll be in one soon. The second conclusion is this. A trial becomes a temptation when we respond incorrectly. What God means for good, Satan means for evil. You remember the story of Joseph? Sure you do. I believe it was God's providence that put him in the pit that led him into slavery at Potiphar's house. We know, we've seen the end of the story. We know how it all worked out. And I think we can all say without a doubt, yes, God led him into a time of testing in his life. But what happened when he was at Potiphar's house? The devil came along in the form of a wicked woman And she tempted him to do evil. Well, thankfully, he didn't do it. Thankfully, he denied her request. But it just goes to show you how in a time of trial and testing, God is working it for good, but the devil is going to come, and he's got a plan, and he's got an agenda at the same time. Now, fast forward to the end of Joseph's life. Okay, now he is prime minister, you might say, of all of Egypt. He's he has endured the test of the pit. He has endured the test of slavery and he has endured the test of being in the dungeon. Now he's got gold chains around his neck. Now he has power and authority like nobody in the world except for Pharaoh. And he sees his brothers again, and he reveals to them who he is. They think that he's, he must be dead. Their whole life they've lived with guilt. And what does he tell them? Listen, fellas, don't be sorry. Don't beat yourself up with guilt anymore. Because even though you meant this for evil, God meant this for good. So... There's both sides, aren't there? God says we're to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There will be times when God will lead us into trials and testing. But while you're facing those trials, don't let the devil get the best of you. Don't let him steal your spirit. Don't let him rob you of your joy. Don't let him diminish the faith that you have in God. You see, God gives us the grace that we need in the time we need the help. All right? Gives us grace. That's why Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 15 such a powerful verse. Because God tells us that he wants to help us when we cry out to him. And he tells us that, that, that just like we were, he was tempted in every way. And yet he did it without sin. Now, I would like to say that every time I've been tempted that I've done it without sin. I'd like to say that every time every time I faced a difficulty in my life that I could say, no, I, I never got a bad attitude about it. I never got mad at God. I never doubted. I never wanted to quit. I never wanted to criticize. 
I never gossiped. I never let it get to me. I would love to be able to say that, but I can't say that. But Jesus, the Bible says when we pray to him, we realize that he was tempted in every way, and yet he did it without sin. And the Bible goes on to say that he is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. So, listen, Jesus is touched by the weakness of our feeble flesh. Uh, write, write this down, all right? Whatever touches us, touches him. Let me say that again. Whatever touches us, touches him. Uh, we hear politicians all the time say stupid things like, I feel your pain, I feel your pain. And it's become a cliche, you know? But in Jesus' case, it's true. He is moved by our sorrow. He is aware of our tears. He is touched by our failures. He does know what we're going through. And sometimes when we are in the middle of a hard time, somebody might come up to you and say something like this. I know just what you're going through. You ever have somebody say that? Did that encourage you when they said that? Probably not. Sometimes when somebody tells you that, it almost feels cruel. Because let's face it, how in the world can we be sure what another person is thinking or feeling? We can't. Okay. Even if I have gone through something similar, I guarantee you that I have not gone through it the same way that you went through it or felt it the same way that you went through it or felt it. If, if, if you were to have found Job sitting in those ashes after losing those children and walk up to him and say, hey, man, I know what you're going through. I don't think he would have liked that very much. I don't think that he would have liked for you to say, oh, man, hang in there, Job. God will never lay anything on you that you can't handle. All right. We don't want to hear those things when we're hurting. But we know this. When we pray to God, what we feel, he feels. If you feel brokenhearted, he can feel that. If you feel afraid, if you feel scared and fearful, remember that your creator knows what you're going through. He can be touched with the feeling of your infirmity. So don't just think you're going through this thing all by yourself because you're not. When you pray, you're praying to a God who relates and a God who feels. So we can look at Matthew chapter number six, and we can obey the word of God, and we can pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. All right? We can pray that with confidence because we know he'll meet our needs because he always has. But we can also pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, okay? Because what we're doing is we are admitting that we have no power and no clue how to face the problems of life by ourselves. But God delights in helping those who have nowhere else to go but to the Lord. So here's the truth I want you to remember from all of this, okay? And we're through. Appreciate you following along with all of this tonight. Here's what I want you to remember. Satan wants something from us in the moment of temptation. And so does God. There are two forces at battle at the same time. And some of you, you're going through the toughest time of your life right now. And we're fearful, and we don't know when things are going to end, okay? But in this moment of testing, what God has sent to America as a test, you mark it down, the devil's going to exploit it. The devil's going to try to co-opt it and use it for our harm. I want you to, to write down this verse reference, and I, if you don't already have it memorized, I want you to memorize it this week. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 
1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Bible says uh, that when we come to God, he says, there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but he will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I want you to write that down and think about it, memorize it this week. Well, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope that it uh, gives you a little bit of a, maybe a new insight on uh, that verse. And uh, if the Lord has uh, given you a thought about it and you'd like to uh, email me about it, feel free to do that. You can do that through our, our church page. And I hope this evening that you'll just find you a place to make you an altar, uh, maybe right there by your seat or beside your bed this evening, and just go to the Lord and say, Lord, during this time of my testing, help me not to be uh, tempted or to give in to the devil because he's been working on me. He's been working on me to doubt and to fear. He's been working on me in all kinds of ways and turn that over to the Lord. If you're not saved, you can put your faith and your trust in him and be saved. Again, if you've got any questions about that, you write to me through our church website or you message me. I'd be happy to talk with you about it. Well, Let's be closed down in a word of prayer. Thank you all for watching this evening and I look forward to another good uh, church service this Sunday. Be in prayer for me. I've been praying for you. And let's ask God uh, to help us this evening. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for how it comforts our hearts. Be with our people now. Bless us as we continue on throughout our week. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget, we've taken up a virtual offering tonight for our missions account. If you're set up for online giving, just text an amount and the word missions uh, to be a blessing to our missionaries. and uh, Or you can give through our online uh, portal there at crossroads.com. Lord bless you. Have a good evening.